This is lecture 66E, uh, Bolshevism Rise in India and the Evolution of the Communist Party of India. Uh, founding the party, in 1910, the Indian poet Dan Gopal was in Stanford University where he introduced Evelyn Trent to M. N. Roy. In 1917, Trent and Roy were married in the USA. In 1919, the Roys were recruited into the common turn by Michael Baroden in Mexico City and became part of the formative group of the Communist Party of Mexico. Baroden and the PCM then sent Trent and Roy as the Mexican representatives to the 1920 Second Congress of the Third International. And we last visited these two in Volume 2 and Chapter 30 on Communism in Mexico. Now, of special interest, I think, is Evelyn Trent Roy who had married M. N. Roy in 1917 in the USA when she was a Stanford University graduate. And she played an intellectual role in the international communist movement in Mexico and the Soviet Republic before Lenin sent her on a mission to organize the Communist Party of India. Her common turn name was Shantai Devi. Now, Shantai Devi in the Soviet Republic, that is Evelyn Trent Roy, taught in the International Political School and she contributed articles under that name. And she took charge of the common term Ang English language journals Masses and Imprecor. On the 17th of August, Oct October 1920, soon after the Second Congress of the Common Turn, the Communist Party of India was founded at a meeting held in Tashkent, soon to be capital of the Turkestan Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic. The founding members of the party were M. N. Roy, Evelyn Trent Roy, Albani Mukherjee, Rosa Fintengoff Mukherjee, Muhammad Ali, or Ahmed Hassan, Muhammad Shafiq Siddiqui, Rafiq Ahmad of Bhopal, and MPBT Achara, and Sultan Ahmed Khan Taran of Northwest Province. There were other would-be Bolsheviks in India. These included a group in Bengal, led by Muzaffar Ahmed, another in Bombay, led by S.A. Danj, one group in Madras was led by Singara Belu Chetiar, one in the United Provinces led by Shakai Usmani, and one in the Punjab and Sindh led by Ghulam Hussein. However, only Usami became a CPI party member. Usami's leadership spanned the period between this 1920 meeting and the next meeting five years later when the CPI was reformed, refounded if you were, in Kanpur in 1925. He was also the only candidate to the British Parliament contested elections while he was residing in India in prison. He was sentenced to a total of 16 years in jail after, after being tried in the Kanpur Kanpur case of 1923 and later the Meerut conspiracy case of 1929. N. M. Roy wrote in his M. Memoirs, which was serialized in the weekly Radical Humanist, from India and later as a book in Bombay that he uh, and he did not mention the name of his wife Evelyn Trent or anything about his married life with her. Hence a mystery remained for many years and even close associates of M. N. Roy were often not aware of Evelyn Trent. Nevertheless things cannot be camouflaged for long. In the history of the Communist Party of India the role of Evelyn Trent came out because Muzaffar Ahmed recorded her role. Evelyn was a founding member of the Indian Communist Party at Tashkent during 1920. As we have seen in Volume 2, Chapter 30, Evelyn Trent had traveled along with her husband, M. N. Roy, to Mexico, where they founded a New World Communist Party for the first time. Michael Baroden and the newly formed Communist Party of Mexico sent her and her husband to the Second Common Turn Congress in 1920. While in Russia, Evelyn taught in the International Political School, and she contributed articles under that name of Shanti Devi, as, I, as we have mentioned, and she was running the journals Masses and Imprecor. Now, I found this Evelyn Trent to be a fascinating person. Evelyn was the eighth child of her father, Lamartine C. Trent, a famous mining engineer who discovered a gold streak in Idaho Springs, Clear Creek, Colorado. Her father's history provides much insight into this early heroine of international communism. Lamartine C. Trent lived from 1849 to 1935.
He was a mining engineer who had emigrated from London at the age of 11, coming to the USA and settling in the copper mining district around Lake Superior. He fought in the U.S. Civil War and afterwards moved west to Montana and Colorado. It was in these states that he established his reputation as a mining engineer and garnered an international reputation. He was associated with some of the largest mining enterprises of those times. As the Western representative for Fraser and Chalmers, he spent 25 years in business in Salt Lake City. From there he went to Japan, Australia, and Tasmania as a mining expert with law offices in London. Trent's later years were spent in California, where he developed the dairy farm mine at Van Trent, which he later sold to the Guggenheim family interest. Following this sale, he entered the mining machinery business in Los Angeles, Washington, D.C., and Virginia. Trent returned to the West Coast in 1926, and shortly thereafter, he retired to live in Auburn, where he died in 1935. The Salt Lake Tribune newspaper reported that seven sons and daughters survived him. Among them, Walter E. Trent, a New York mining engineer, Goodwin M. Trent, Mrs. B. S. Varaya of Boise, Idaho, Mrs. J. D. Meredith of Sacramento, California, Mrs. Helen Trent Power of Piedmont, California, and Miss Evelyn Trent. Now, back to our story. Evelyn was a brilliant student in high school and then at Stanford University. M. N. Roy and Evelyn separated in 1925. In my opinion, the two split politically. Evelyn was far superior in her knowledge of life and her commitment to Leninism. Roy pursued an entirely incorrect, incorrect course, but at any rate, she returned to and lived in the USA where she died in 1970. Eminent scholars in political science have interviewed Evelyn, including Robert C. North, a political science professor at Stanford University. She preferred to remain silent about the divorce and M. N. Roy did not tell the truth about his first wife in his memoirs. Roy went on to marry Ellen Gottschalk, whom he had joined, joined him in India, and Roy and Ellen settled down in their house at number 13 Mohini Road, Dera Dunn. Ellen lived in that house even after Roy died in 1954, until her death in 1960. She also became a member of the Indian National Congress. Dr. Ine Narasetti undertook the task of research on Evelyn. The Institute of Social Science at Amsterdam provided some documents. Narasetti interviewed the son of Evelyn Trent's sister, Mr. Divan Meredith, in Los Angeles during the 1990s. In his book, with all the available records, it's its first of its kind in the world, and it's now available in ebook form at Kindle Books. Now, as for the background. V.I. Lenin sent M. N. Roy to Tashkent in October 1920 as head of the Central Asiatic Bureau of the Comintern. He was to create the Communist Party of India and then the Indian Military School to train an Indian army of revolutionaries. Lenin insisted that Evelyn Trent go also, as he had been impressed with what Michael Baroden had told him about her. In April 1921, the Indian Military School was closed and replaced the, by the Bolsheviks with the Communist University of the Toilers of the East. For the moment, this satisfied the UK rulers sufficiently for Russia to qualify for industrial assistance from Britain, although the Brits had made a solemn aid promise they did not intend to keep that promise, nor of honoring their commitments made a month earlier under the Anglo-Russian Trade Pact in March 1921. Before the military school closure, the school had indoctrinated many Muslim volunteers called Mujahareens, who were on their way to Turkey to fight for the restoration of the caliphate. Shaukat Usmani was one of the Mujahareens who taught in Moscow and Tashkent. Early in 1922, 13 Indians belonging to the Emigre Indian Communist Party crossed the Pamirs and reached India. They were all arrested and put in jail by the Brit occupation government in what became known as the Moscow Peshawar Conspiracy Case. The Tashkent Moscow alumni had been sent all over India. Along the way, they encountered the local would-be Bolsheviks. For a variety of reasons normal in early organizational stages, the official common term nuclei had poor working relations with many of these locals, including S.A. Danj, Muzaffar Ahmed, S.S. Mirajakar, and S.V. Gatti. At the same time, 
a different kind of tension was building up between the Communist Party of Great Britain and the emigre communists. Therefore, four members of the emigre CPI, including his body, went to attend the 6th Congress of the Comintern without the emigre Communist Party of India's nomination. These tensions did not come out into the open because of the strict police surveillance. Usmani was operating underground under the nom de guerre of Sikandar Sur. His common turn code name was D. A. Naroji. Under attack, the British Indian regime and its masters in London did not wait to see what the Indian Reds would do. They launched immediate attacks by the police and prosecutors against those they could find, and the Kanpur conspiracy case was the first such legal adventure. The trial at Kanpur. After Peshawar in 1922, the British government instituted two more conspiracy cases. One case was filed in Kanpur uh, in 1924 and another in Meerut in 1929. The accused in these cases included important communist organizers who worked in India, such as S. A. Danj, Muzaffar Ahmad, Nalini Gupta, and S. V. Gatti, and members of the emigre party such as Rafiq Ahmad, Shakas Imani, and M. N. Roy. On 17 March 1924, M. N. Roy, S. A. Danj, Muzaffar Ahmed, Nalini Gupta, Shakat Usmani, S. Wimvaro Chatiar, Gulam Hussein, and others were charged as communists. The indictment said they were seeking to, quote, deprive the em King Emperor of his sovereignty of British India by complete separation of India from imperialistic Britain by a violent revolution, unquote. That was what was called the Kanpur, now spelled Kanpur. Bolshevik conspiracy case. The case attracted interest of people towards Comintern plan to bring about violent revolution in India. Quote, pages of newspapers daily splash sensational communist plans and people for the first time learned such a large scale about communism and its doctrines and the aims of the communist international India in India. Uh, unquote. Singaravel Chatiar was released because of illness. M. N. Roy was out of the country and there unavailable for arrest. Ghulam Hussein confessed that he had received money from the Russians in Kabul and was pardoned. Muzaffar Ahmed, Shaukat Usmani, and S. A. Danj were sentenced to four years of imprisonment. However, for the Indian masses, this was the first time that they had ever heard of Bolshevism. After the Kanpur trial had triumphantly declared that the case had, quote, finished off the communists, unquote, uh, that is, the Brit British had declared that. Nevertheless, in the industrial town of Kanpur in December 1925, a conference of different communist groups was convened. The meeting was held under the chairmanship of Singara Velu Chetiar with party leaders S. A. Danj, Musafur Ahmed, Nalini Gupta, and Shaukat Usmani among the organizers. The meeting adopted a resolution for the formation of the Communist Party of India with its headquarters in Bombay now Mumbai, previously Calcutta. The British government's extreme hostility toward the Bolsheviks made them decide not to use the name Communist Party. Instead, they chose the name the Workers and Peasants Party. Now, the Meerut conspiracy case. The Raj government was scared shitless over the growing influence of the Communist International in India. Its ongoing response was to foist yet another conspiracy case, the Meerut conspiracy case indicted, indicted Usmani along with 32 other people. They were arrested on or about 20 March 1929. Their trial began under Section 121A of the Indian Penal Code that declares, quote, whoever within or without British India conspires to commit any of the offenses punishable by Section 121 or to deprive the King of the sovereignty of British India or any part thereof or conspires to overawe by means of criminal force or the show of criminal force, the government of India or any local government shall be punished with transportation for life or any shorter term or with imprisonment of either description which may extend to ten years. The charges. Though all the accused were not communists, the charges framed against them betrayed the government's fear of growth of communist ideas in India. Lester Hutchinson, later released as innocent after spending four years in prison, was arrested as an afterthought. He fucked up when he accepted the task of conducting some of the trade union agitation work 
after the arrest of the others, but he was merely a journalist on the Indian Daily Mail newspaper and unconnected with the trade union movement. The main charges were that in 1921, Danj, Shaukat Usmani, and Muzaffar Ahmad entered into a conspiracy to establish a branch of the common turn in India, and they were helped by various persons, including the accused Philip Spratt and Benjamin Francis Bradley, sent to India by the Communist International. The aim of the accused persons, according to the charges, was to deprive the King Emperor of the sovereignty of British India, and for such purpose to use the methods and carry out the program and plan of the campaign outlined and ordained by the Communist International. The Sessions Court in Meerut awarded stringent sentences to the accused in January 1933. Of the accused, 27 persons were convicted with various durations of transportation. While Muzaffar Ahmed was transported for life, Danj, Spratt, Gatte, Jaklakar, and Nimkar were each awarded transportation for a myriad of, period of 12 years. Usmani was given 10 years. On appeal in J July 1933, the sentences of Ahmad, Danj, and Usmani were reduced three years. Reductions were later made in the other sentences. Now, fighting back. On Defe 25 December 1925, a party conference was organized in Kampur. MI5 said that five per 500 persons took part in the conference. Ahmed called Satya Bakata convened the conference. At the conference, Satya Bakata argued for a national communism and, and against subordination to the Comintern. The other delegates outvoted him and he left the conference venue in protest. The conference adopted the name Communist Party of India in conformity with Lenin's original orders, confirmed at the first Comintern Congress. Accordingly, groups such as the Labour Kaisan Party of Hindustan, LKPH, dissolved into the unified CPI. The emigre CPI was substituted by the organization now operating inside India. Soon after the 1926 conference at the, of the Workers and Peasants Party of Bengal, the underground CPI directed its members to join the provincial Workers and Peasants Parties. All open communist activities were through the Workers and Peasants Parties, and the WPP was essentially the left wing of the Indian National Congress from 1925 through 1929. The WPP was an important and influential por por force in the Bombay labor movement. The CPI had some success in allying with other left elements inside the Cong Congress party, including Roy's friend Jawaharlal Nehru. In 1928, the 6th Congress of the Communist Party was held. In April 1927, the KMT had turned on the Chinese Communists, as you will recall. And now a review of the policy on forming alliances with the national bourgeoisie in the con colonial countries had to be conducted. The colonial thesis of the Sixth Comintern Congress called upon the Indian Communists to combat the national reformist leaders. They were ordered to unmask the national reformism of the Indian National Congress and oppose all phrases of the Sarwajis, Gandhis, and others about passive resistance. In 1928, the Sixth Congress of the Communist Party was held. In April 27, as we have seen, the KMP, KMT had turned on the Ch Chinese Communists. And anyway, uh, nevertheless, the Congress differentiated the characters of the Chinese KMT and the Indian Swar Swarajist Party. The Swarajists were declared vacillators, thus neither a reliable ally nor a direct enemy. The Congress on the, called on the Indian Communists to exploit the contradictions between the national bourgeoisie and the pr British imperialists. Then the 10th plenum of the Executive Committee of the International, the Communist International, held on the 3rd to 19th of July 1929, directed the Indian Communists to break with the WPP. When the Communists left, the WPP fell apart. On 20 March 1929, arrests were made against the WPP, CPI, and other labor leaders in several parts of India in the Meerut conspiracy case we have just reviewed, the communist leadership was now behind bars and the trial proceedings were to last for four years. As of 1934, the main centers of activity of CPI were Bombay, Calcutta, and Punjab. The party had also been extending its activities to Madras. 
A group of Andhra and Tamil students, among them P. Sundaraya, were recruited to the CPI by Amir Haider Khan. In 1933, the party was reorganized again following the release of the Meerut leaders. A central committee of the party was then set up. In 1934, the reorganized party was accepted as the Indian section of the Communist International. When Indian left-wing elements formed the Congress Socialist Party in 1935, the CPI branded it as social fascist. The League Against Gandhiism, initially known as the Gandhi Boycott Committee, was a political organization in Calcutta founded by the underground Communist Party of India and others to launch militant anti-imperialist activities, and that group took the name League Against Gandhism in 1934, which brings us to the Popular Front of India, the United Front Against Fascism. On 2 August 1935, at the 7th Comintern Congress, Stalin and George Dimitrov turned the Comintern toward building a popular front against fascism. Then the Indian Communists decided that the better part of their value lay in rebuilding their relations with the Indian National Congress. The Communists joined the Congress Socialist Party, CSP, which worked as a left wing of the Congress. Thus the CPI now accepted the CSP demand for a constituent assembly. The CPI, however, said that the demand for a constituent assembly was not a demand to substitute for Soviets. In July 1937, the first Kerala unit of the CPI was founded at a clandestine meeting in Calicut, Bombay or Mumbai. Five persons were present at the meeting, P. Krishna Pillai, Elam, Elankulam Manakal Sankaram, E.M.S. Nambudirapad, N.C. Sekar, K. Damodaran, De, uh, and S. V. Gatti. The first four were members of the CSP in Kerala. The latter, Gatti, was a CPI Central Committee member who are, had arrived from Madras. Contacts between the CSP in Kerala and the CPI had begun in 1935 when P. Sundaraya, a Central Committee member of CPI based in Madras at that time, met with EMS Nambu Dirapad and Krishni Pillai. Sanduraya and Gatte visited Kerala at several times and met with the CSP leaders there. The contacts were facilitated through the national meetings of the Congress, CSP, and the All India Kisan Sabha. In 1936-37, the cooperation between socialists and communists had reached its peak. For example, at the Second Congress of the CSP held in Meerut in January 36, a thesis was adopted which declared that there was need to build, quote, a United Indian Socialist Party based on Marxism-Leninism, unquote. At the third CSP Congress held in Faisalpur, several communists were included into the CSP National Executive Committee. At Kerala, communists won control over CSP and for a brief period controlled the Congress party there. Two communists, EMS Nambudirapad and Z.A. Ahmed, became all India Joint Secretaries of CSP, and the CPI also had two other members inside the CSP executive. Timed with the March 1940-53 Ramgar Congress Conference, the CPI released a policy paper entitled The Proletarian Path. It emphasized weakening the state of the British Empire in the time of war. It gave the call for a general strike in favor of no tax, no rent policies, and mobilizing people for an armed revolutionary uprising. The National Executive of the CSP assembled at Rambard expelled the Communists from the CSP, therefore, and about 1,700 Congress members were arrested in 1940. Thus, the position of the Congress was weakened, as many Congress members were imprisoned between 1940 and 1945. The Congress also held an open session in Ramgar on 23 November 1940. The All India Congress Committee met in Allahabad, Uttar Pradesh. On July 1942, the CPI was legalized by the World War II alliance of Britain and the Soviet Union against Nazi Germany. The Communists strengthened their control over, control over the All India Trade Union Congress, but the all out war effort meant the Communists made enemies because that meant temporarily opposing the Quit India movement. CPI contested the Provincial Legislative Assembly elections of 1946 with candidates contesting 108 of the 1,585 seats 
and it won eight seats. In total, the CPI voted 666,723 when 86% of the adult population of India lacked voting rights. The party had contested three seats in Bengal and won all of them. One CPI candidate, Samantha Lahiri, was elected to the constituent assembly that was to design India's future. Now, after independence in 1947, during the period following independence, the internal situation in the party was chaotic. The party shifted rapidly between left-wing and right-wing positions. In February 1948, at the Second Communist Party Congress in Calcutta, B.T. Ranadive was elected General Secretary. He had been a major leader of the All India Trade Union Congress in Bombay and was active with the Irini Kemgar Union of the textile workers in that city. Along the way, he had become well known as the leader of the struggles of the railway workers and he became the secretary of the GIP Railway Men's Union. In 1939, he had married Baimal, a trade union activist, and in short, he was popular in the party. The conference adopted the program of democratic revolution that declared the importance of the struggle against caste injustice. The party led armed struggles against a series of local monarchs that were reluctant to give up their power to a national bourgeois democracy, and such insurgencies took place in Tripura, Telangana, and Kerala. The Telangana Rebellion The most important rebellion took place in Telangana against the Nizam of Hyderabad. During 1945 and 1946, the Communists built up a people's army and militia that controlled an area with a population of three million. The Telangana Bonded Labor Movement, also de des designated the Telangana Peasants' Arm Struggle, was a small farmer against the feudal lords of the Telangan region fight and later the fiefdom of Hyderabad between 1946 and 1951. The Communists organized a rebellion demanding the distribution of land. The Nizam resisted the bourgeois democratic regime after the proclamation of Indian independence, so the Communists stepped up their campaign. They should have demanded radical agrarian reform, but instead took the position stating the flag of the Indian Union was also the flag of the people of Hyderabad against the wishes of the ruling Asafjah dynasty. Nationalist demands took the place of class struggle demands, exactly the opposite to what Lenin had done in the Tsarist Empire after 1917. In 1946, the farmers revolted against the oppressive feudal lords and quickly took 4,000 villages in the Warangal and Baidar districts. The farmers and laborers were revolting against landlords called Jagirdars with feudal land grants and ter territorial title holders called Desmukhs. These military bosses had established their rule over surroundings called Samslands. Reddies, who were a warrior caste, who had later become feudal overlords and peasant proprietors, were India's kulaks, bossing these Samslands. The, Red only, the Reddies not only ruled over the village's communities, they enforced the tax collection, collections and personally stole all the land in every area. The Nizam ruled directly over his capital, Hyderabad. He was the top known boss, so to speak, using the Reddies as his local bosses. Chikali Alama, belonging to the Rajaka caste, had revolted against Zamindar Ramachandra Reddy, Visnur Deshmukh, as he tried to steal her four acres. She became an inspiration for many others rebelling against the feudal lords of the Tenangana region. In 1921, she had joined the mass popular organizations called Andhra Mahasabha, the Andhra, People, Andhra People's Society and the Communist Party. She worked actively against the Nizam government as a CPI cadre in charge, and her house was the center for activities against the feudal landlords collaborating with Nizam. In 2016, a beautiful gold statue of her was unveiled in the Medak district of Telangana State. Her anti-civil forfeiture revolt inspired many to join the movement. So the agitation led by communists was successful in taking over 4,000 villages from the feudal lords and 10 million acres of agricultural land was distributed to landless peasants. Around 4,000 peasants lost their lives in the struggle fighting feudal private armies. It later became a fight against Nizam Osman Ali Khan, 
Asaf Jaw, the, the eight, seventh. The initial modest arms were to do away with aims, uh, were to do away with the illegal and excessive exploitation meted out by these feudal lords in the name of bonded labor. The most strident demand was for the writing off of all debts of the peasants that were manipulated by the feudal lords. Nizam's resistance. With Hyderabad's administration failing after 1945, the Nizam succumbed to the pressure of the Muslim elite and started the Razakar movement. At the same time, the Nizam was resisting the Indian government's efforts to bring the Hyderabad state into the Indian Union. The government sent the army in September 1948 to annex Hyderabad state into the Indian Union. The Communist Party had already instigated the peasants to use guerrilla tactics against the Razakars and around 3,000 villages, or about 41,000 square kilometers, had come under peasant rule. The landlords were either killed or driven out and the land was redistributed. These victorious villages established communes from an instant of Soviet mirrors to administer their region. These communi community governments were integrated regionally into a central organization the rebellion was led by the Communist Party of India under the banner of Andhra Mahasabha. Andhra Mahasabha, the Big 23. There were 23 well-known people at the forefront of the movement, and then I give their names, but I won't bother with that here. Um, annexing Hyderabad on the 17th of November 1948, the police were said to stop the rebellion against Nizam's rule over Hyderabad state. They set up a military administration that was eventually merged into the Indian Union. In the fighting, tens of thousands of people lost their lives. The majorities killed by the army were Muslims. The Asaf Jahi ruling nobles of Telangana killed many more people. The Communist Party of India retains strong support in the grassroots of Telangana today. Uchalapi Sudara went on to become the first leader of opposition in independent India. The last Nizam, Asaf Jao VII, was made Raj Prabhuk of the Hyderabad state from 26 January 1950 to 31 October 1956. The 1952 elections led to the victory of the Congress party in Hyderabad state. Bur Burgula Ramakrishna Rao was the first chief minister of Hyderabad state from 52 to 56 and in 1956 Hyderabad state was merged with Andhra state to form Andhra Pradesh and it was again separated from Andhra Pradesh to establish the state of Telangana in 2014. Now as <clears throat> with regard to land reform, the revolt ensured the victory of the Communist Party in Andhra Pradesh in 1952 elections. Land, re land reforms were recognized as important and various acts were passed to implement, implement them. After the rebellion was brutally crushed, the party abandoned the policy of armed struggle. Ranadive was deposed and denounced as a left adventurist. In Manipur, the party became a force to reckon with through the agrarian struggles led by Janetta Irawat Singh. Singh had joined the CPI in 1946 at the 1951 Congress of the party People's Democracy was substituted by main National de Democracy as the main slogan of the party. In Bihar, in 1939, the Communist Party was organized. Post-independence, the Par Communist Party achieved success in Bihar and Jharkhand, where it conducted the fight for land reform. The trade union movement did well in Bihar in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and these achievements of the Communists in Bihar put the Communist Party in the forefront of the left movement of India. Bihar produced some of the legendary leaders like Kashin leaders Sajanad Saraswati and Karyand Sharma, as well as intellectual giants like Jagannath Sarkar, Jogendra Sharma, Indra Deep Sinha. Arising were mass leaders like Chandra Shekhar Singh and Sundil Mukherjee and trade union leaders like Hidar Das. It was in Bihar that the Communist Party, under the leadership of Janath Sarkar, exposed the JP's false reactionary line. In early 1950s, young communist leadership was uniting textile workers, bank employees, and unorganized sector workers, gaining mass support in northern India. National communist leaders like S.A. Dange, 
Chandra Rishwara Rao and P.K. Fazumian Nair were encouraging them. Firebrand communist leaders like Homi F. Desi, Guru Radha Kishan, H.L. Parwana, Sarju Pandi, Darshan Singh Canadian, and Avtar Singh Malhotra were emerging and leading the masses, and the working class in particular. This was the first leadership of communists that was very close to the masses there, and people considered them champions of the cause of the workers and the poor. In Delhi, May Day was organized at Chandi Chowk Gadtagar, demonstrating the unity of the working classes and at igniting the passion for communism in northern India. In 1952, the CPI became the leading opposition party in the lower house of parliament called the Lok Sabha, and this while the Indian National Congress was in power. At this time, there was no CPI-M. Khrushchev's revisionist gang had not yet wrested control from the Stalinists and the CPSU. The communist movement, and CPI in particular, emerged as a forefront runner after Guru Radha Kishan undertook a fast unto death for 24 days to promote the cause of the textile workers in Delhi. Cap propaganda had instilled fear among many common families about the communists. However, communist successes in World War II and in China as a whole provided the objective situation, and the fast helped mobilize people in favor of the Indian communist movement because during this people period, people with their families used to visit the fasters to encourage the CPI cadre. This model of selfishness for the society benefited the CPI more than had been expected. Almost other, all other state units of the party in the Hindi heartland followed this trend. The Communist Party trade union, AITUC, became the vanguard force uniting the workers in the textiles. That's the All India uh, Trade Union Congress, became uh, the textile workers municipal and the unorganized sector, sectors. It was the first labor union in the unorganized sector, emerge, emerging in the leadership of Comrade Guru Radha Kishan in Delhi's Sadar Bazaar district. This movement of workers in favor of CPI worked well in Delhi. It paved the way for the success of the CPI in the elections in working class dominated areas of Delhi. A comrade Gangadhar Adhikari and our old friend EMS Nambodirapad applauded these dynamic comrades for their selfless approach and organizational capabilities. These firebrand communists gained more prominence when Telangana hero Chandra Rajaswara Rao became general secretary of the Communist Party of India. In other states, in 1952, in the Travancore Cochin general election, the Communist Party was banned, so could not take part. However, in the general elections in 1957, the CPI emerged as the largest opposition party. In 1957, the CPI also won the state elections in Kerala. This was the first time that an opposition party won control over an Indian state. EMS Nambudirapad became chief minister. At the 1957 International Meeting of Communist Parties in Moscow, the Communist Party of China criticized the CPI for having formed a ministry in Kerala. So now there are two lines in international communism. This was the beginning of the public split between the Khrushchev revisionists of the CPSU and the Mao Zedong Leninists of the CPC. These ideological differences led to the split in the party in 1964 when two different party conferences were held one of the CPI and one of the Communist Party of India Marxist. There is a common misconception that the rift during the Sino-Indian War was due to the CPI supporting China that caused this split, but it was a split like those all over the world between two lines and not the war that led to the 1962 split in Indian Communism. During 1970 and 1977, the CPI allied with the Congress Party. In Kerala, they formed a government together with Congress, with the CPI leader C. Achutla Menon as chief minister. After the fall of the regime of Indira Gandhi, the CPI mem membership began to see the light. Its newly acquired clarity meant it reoriented, reoriented itself toward the CPI-M. In 1986, the CPI's leader in Punjab, an MLA, a member of the LA in the Punjabi legislature, Darshan Singh 
Canadian who was assassinated by six extremists. On 19 May 87, Deepak Dewan, General Secretary of the Punjab CPIM, was murdered. Altogether, about 200 communist leaders, mostly most were six, were killed by six extremists in the Punjab. The CPI was recognized by the Election Committee of India as a national party. To date, the CPI happens to be the only national political party from India to have contested all the general elections using the same electoral symbol. New class government confusion in Russia and the Communist Party of China's success led to massive defeat for the CPI in the Indian general election of 2014, and the Election Commission of India sent a letter to the CPI asking why its national majority or its national party status should not be revoked, and if similar performance is repeated in the next election, the CPI will no longer be a national party. On the national level, the CPI supported the Indian National Congress-led United Progressive Alliance government, and along with other parliamentary left parties, without taking part in it. Upon attaining, attaining power in May 2004, the United Progressive Alliance formulated a program called the Common Minimum Program, or CMP. The left support to the uh, United Progressive Alliance, or UPA, is based on this. Provisions of the Common Minimum Program mention ending disinvestment, making massive social sector outlays, and an independent foreign policy. On the 8th of July in 2008, Prakash Karat, General Secretary of the CPIM, announced that the left was withdrawing its support over the decision by the government to go ahead with the United States-India Peaceful Atomic Energy Act, uh, Atomic Energy Cooperation Act. The left party's membership demanded this as their minimum. In West Bengal, the CPIM participates in the left front, as well as in the state government in Manipur. In Kerala, the CPIM is part of the left democratic front. In Tripura, the CPIM is a partner of the governing left front, having a minister. And in Tamil Nadu, the CPIM is part of the Progressive Democratic Alliance, and it is involved in the late left democratic front in Maharashtra. However, the revisionist CPI still carries on, its current general secretary is Sudhakar Reddy. Its, its principal mass organizations are the All India Trade Union Congress, the All India Youth Federation, the All India Students Federation, the National Federation of India Women, All India Kaisan Sabha, the peasants' organization, the Bharatiya Kat Mazdoor Union of Agricultural Workers, and the All India State Government Employees Federation for State Government Employees. <coughs> In May 2010, the many streams selected essays by Janath Sarkar and reminiscing sketches compiled by Katam Sarkar and edited by, edited by Matali Sarkar was published in Bangalore. In Bihar's Mithila region, the CPI's Bogendra Jha led the fight against the Mahand, Mahants and Zamzandars winning as an MP in the parliamentary elections. And it would appear to me from afar that the CPM is replacing the CPI as the legitimate Communist Party in India. And that brings us to a conclusion of our uh, <coughs> lectures, uh, our lectures on the Indian portion of the South Asia. And we're going to move on next uh, to Afghanistan, Nepal, and some of the mountain, Bhutan, some of the mountain kingdoms.